has uh, a couple really impressive degrees, food science from UC Davis, biochem, molecular biology, super science background. Um, she's been at New Belgium since 2011. And um, she is also the co-founder of Draft Lab, which is the app that we've used here on the stream before. So once again, <laughs> maybe you could tell us about Draft Lab <laughs> and your background, Lindsay. Yeah, yeah I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, yeah, I studied biochemistry. I, I loved everything about that science. Biochemistry just absolutely fascinated me and I, I had no idea how to apply it. And I knew that I was pretty miserable just in the, the typical laboratory setting. Um, so I did my graduate degree in food science and technology and um, fell in love with beer and brewing and, and sensory, which was really the surprise. I went to UC Davis so that I could study brewing and fermentation science. Um, while I was there, I worked with Dr. Charlie Bamforth and I studied beer, um, well, I studied gluten-free beer, um, wrote a couple papers about that, and that was very fascinating, super cool. But when I, it came time to choose classes, um, I, I gravitated towards a lot of the sensory science, um, and I was uh, very honored to be able to work with Dr. Hildegard Heyman, um, not work, take classes from her, um, and also Dr. Michael Omani, which are some of the, you know, more well-known sensory scientists in the industry. And um, I refer to their textbooks all the time. So I absolutely fell in love with what they were doing. Um, sensory scientists on the whole seem to be really passionate about what we're doing. Um, it's it's our senses. It's everything that we are taking into um, into our bodies, and then we're trying to just like translate that and do it in in a systematic and and um, consistent format, which really speaks to um, a lot of different aspects of life: sociological, philosophical. Um, you know, and it's a great way to also um, apply biochemistry, which was my other background. Um, about a year ago, uh, I co-founded with uh, a few folks uh, a, a draft a, a software system, a sensory software system um, called Draft Lab, and that launched uh, in February. And we've been working together for about a year, and um, we've been seeing some success. It's really a, a cool tool. You guys used it last time, and it can be applied in various different um, aspects of the sensory world and in craft brewing and in specifically in craft brewing. Um, so I'm very happy with where we are with Draft Lab and um, and where I am in the sensory world at New Belgium. I get to work with uh, four other sensory scientists at New Belgium. Um, and about a hundred panelists. So I'm I'm very lucky um, and very happy where I am. So that's that's the gist, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we actually have a lot to uh, unpack there because um, I think most of our audience is not necessarily well, definitely not a beer professional audience. Except for we do have one um, fellow Chicagoland brewer in chat, but. Um, Panelist, sensory, all of these things um, I know are yeah. uh, are d terms that we really need to define. So um, could you first tell me specifically what it means to be one of the sensory specialists at New Belgium? What is your what's your day to day and what does that job entail? OK, um, well, that's that's a big one. It encompasses quite a lot um, to typical sensory specialists are uh, you know, wear a lot of hats. I'm kind of an applied statistician. Um, a lot of my days are doing statistics. <laughs> a lot of my days are doing uh, flavor trainings and trying to capture that 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 data that I get from my human beings and translate it into meaningful information. So um, I guess to bring you through what sensory is, it's it's basically the the discipline um, to evoke a response from our human subjects um, and analyze that response, interpret it, and then utilize it to make decisions in our everyday quality assurance life. So we, as a whole, in a QA department, sensory is one of the the three legs that kind of hold up a quality system. So it's us, it's the microbiology lab. So they're making sure that infections are out of the brewery and also that we're pitching the right yeast and our yeast is healthy um, and, uh, and chemistry. So analytical chemistry. And we all work together um, for the main goal of making sure that our flavor is consistent. So true to brand 
and um, also free of all flavors. And we all also work together to do recipe development, um, run tests throughout the brewery. And my job specifically is to harness the potential of our human sensation to be able to um, to, to be able to translate what we experience in flavor to um, like actual quality parameters that can be measured consistently um, and that can be drawn upon to be utilized in new product development or, or recipe development and, and test utilization and stuff. So I know that's pretty broad, but um, generally my instrument, they're, they're human beings instead of using like a pH meter or a microscope or something like that. Um, I use people and it turns out that people are subject to incredible amounts of bias. We're just a lot of stimulation gets brought into our lives and we internalize that. And so uh, we basically try to diminish the judgment process of the human being so that we can try to get as close to what the stimulus is. In our case, it's beer. So what the stimu- what the beer tastes like. Um, and so that, that basically means a lot of flavor training in which we spike beers with various chemicals that we are that are known to be in beer. All food grade, of course. Um, and we train them to be able to identify those repeatedly and uh, and and translate that if we were to see that in a real life situation. So it's mostly quality assurance that that we do, um, making sure that our beer is free of all flavors and, and true to brand. And it's utilizing our human beings to be able to do that. And the cool thing about humans, and you can stop me anytime, Andrew, but <laughs> the cool thing about humans is that we can detect some flavor attributes on a part per trillion level. That's like one drop of water in an Olympic size swimming pool. So we are very, very sensitive, even more sensitive than most analytical instruments out there. So the, really the best way to be able to tell like what flavors are in beer is by asking humans. Um, the other cool thing about humans too is that we can give an overall holistic impression of the total flavor of beer and no other instrument can really do that um, as repeatedly as we can. Um, so anyway, I train them, I take that information and then I utilize it to make everyday decisions about quality, consistency and new beers, new products. <clears throat> yeah, so I guess I think a, a couple of things come to mind. One, I imagine that your job got much more complicated when you guys opened the brewery in Asheville because flavor matching between breweries has to be a real big challenge of you're brewing in two completely different places across the country and you're trying to make the exact same beers. Yeah, certainly. That was a really huge challenge. It's even a challenge to translate, uh, to to match flavor from the pilot brewery to the, you know, a hundred barrel system to 200 barrel system. So it's, it's very difficult to just uh, even do that inside of the brewery using the same water, the same raw materials, uh, the same brewers. Um, it's, it's really hard to scale up even. Um, so to go into a totally different state on the other side of the country with different water chemistry, uh, different altitudes, so different boiling parameters, uh, same raw materials, but a, a totally different brewing system was um, quite challenging. But we we have a lot of really smart people who have been brewing for a long time, um, and we were able to pull it off. Um, we were able to get our first flavor match fat tire within uh, a couple of months of brewing. So we were pretty happy with that. And um, now that we've kind of dialed it in, if you looked at the fat tire recipe, for instance, between Asheville and Fort Collins, we get the same beer. They're, they're, they taste the same, but the brewing parameters are quite different. And it's just to adjust for the water chemistry, to adjust for the, the brewing system itself, um, and to uh, adjust to you know the altitude and, and that kind of thing. So you look at the two recipes and they're different. But the flavor is the same, and that was what was really driving our brewing parameters. So we were in a lot of close contact with them initially, Um, and Fort Collins tasted absolutely everything. Um, Asheville, we had a trained panel up and ready to go, training on Fort Collins Fat Tire and other brands um, for all nearly two years before we opened the brewery. Um, So we had a trained, validated panel um, with boots on the ground ready to go, and that was uh, really integral in making sure that we got ready really quickly. Um, so I'm, 
I'm so excited about Asheville. We're, we're starting to chug out a lot of different brands now and every single brand acts differently. So it's a fun challenge with, um, with every different beer that we decide to try to match on that system. It's pretty cool. You know a little something about that too, I'm sure. <laughs> the other thing that um, occurs to me is that when you talk about the human sensitivity, especially in parts per trillion of certain substances, is taste mm -hmm. is so subjective. And I try to emphasize mm -hmm. that, um, especially when we do beer, when I do beer tastings in real life or the stuff that we've done here on stream, um, is that everybody experiences things differently. And um, one of mm -hmm. the important points that we make at work is that um, some people are completely unable to taste certain chemicals, no matter how you train. Um, like for instance, I am completely blind to DMS. Um, and DMS is mm -hmm. dimethyl sulfide, which is like a cooked vegetable canned corn character that you would get in um, uh, like a beer like Rolling Rock has a ton of DMS in it intentionally. But for most beers, it's, um, it's a it's a off flavor or a, uh, unwanted flavor, but I just I don't have the ability to taste it no matter in how I've trained, I've judged the Great American Beer Festival, we do stuff like this all the time, and I just, it's just, I don't have the ability to taste it. Yeah, yeah, well, you said a couple of things there, and that's one of the reasons why we don't have a panel of, of one person, um, and everybody is just a, kind of a number, like, we love them very much, but they're kind of a number. Um, we don't really weigh anybody's um, evaluation any differently, um, mostly because we do vary in our sensitivity to different flavors. Um, and that's one of the great things about training is understanding where your panelists are. So you would have never known that you were blind to DMS unless you were given DMS multiple times and you were unable to pick it out. Um, so we all have at least probably at least one blindness and what we, we call that a, an anosmia. Um, so that's just the, the genetic inability to, to be able to smell some kind of chemical. Um, so many people are, are anosmic to DMS or um, other chemicals like diacetyl, various mercaptans, that kind of thing. Um, so we make sure that we get a wide enough panel to where we don't have to have everybody be super sensitive to everything. We can all be sensitive to some things and we work really well as, as an entire team. Um, so there's that, that issues, there's the, the anosmia issue. There's also the sensitivity issue. Um, I can taste DMS, but it has to be at very high levels. So we all have different abilities to, to taste different flavors. Um, so that's a, a couple of things that you hit on. You hit on something else that I wanted to mention too, but I'm drawing a blank. Um, oh, subjectivity and taste. Um, so I used to get really bothered when I heard that, that taste is subjective. I mean, it is, um, but part of my job is to try to bring it out of the realm of subjectivity into the objective world where we are just kind of being machines. We're just trying to be instruments and say, this is what's in there. And we don't add any of our hedonic or preference um, to our evaluation. And we all have our preferences. We have our likes and our dislikes. Um, but we basically try to diminish that as much as possible because that's really where you're quite subjective in, in your liking and uh, what, what you want out of a beer. Um, so I, I used to get bothered, but as I've learned um, more and more, we really have to have that piece of subjectivity at the very beginning of a panelist training. Um, the first the first thing that we do when we have a new, when we are exposed to a new sensation or a new aroma, um, is we trigger an emotional response to it, especially if it's something that's familiar. And um, our emotional response is very fast. It's hard to kind of put language around what we're experiencing. It's much easier to have this like visceral, unspoken emotional response that brings up some kind of memory. And if I, as a sensory scientist, don't allow my panelists the space to be able to draw on that emotional piece and that memory piece and that really intimate personal piece, that I'm never going to be able to bridge the gap from that emotional piece all the way over to the more objective and uh, trained panelist part. Um, so we first kind of draw on emotion when we're, when we're integrating something new. Um, and then we bring it from that uh, out of the abstract kind of more into the scientific. So we ask, all right, DMS in this beer, what does that evoke for you? What What is it reminiscent of? And like Andrew said, he said, it's kind of like cooked corn. It's kind of like vegetal. It's um, or 
even on a more distant level, it reminds me of, you know, my grandmother's house, something like that. And then we, we need to try to coax out, okay, well, what was in your grandmother's house? Was it the flowers? Was it the cooked vegetables that she was cooking? Um, and then we, we basically say, okay, that's what it evokes. What it is called is DMS, and I henceforth want you to call it DMS. So, um, but again, we want to leave some room for um, interpretation because we can only really memorize about 30 different chemicals. Um, and there are plenty more in beer that we need to be able to um, to describe without pigeonholing ourselves into just our tiny lexicon. So we want our lexicon to be pretty broad, um, which was part of the, the project with the, the beer flavor map and um, the draft lab as an app. So I don't know if I'm like bringing myself already into that discussion, no, yeah, but hey, maybe I should let you I'll, get uh, me there, Andrew. <laughs> I will, uh, I'll bring those up in just a second. Um, but before we move okay. on, um, I think I wanted to point out um, when I do beer tastings with people or when we're exploring new beers, um, the subjective objective portion of it that I think that I want to try to emphasize more on is not, is, is the, it's not, the right or wrong about it. It's more of the, just because that you, you don't like something doesn't mean that the beer is wrong, or there might be a flavor or a profile in that beer that you don't like, but it might be intentional. Um, because I'm an American brewer. Um, if I get any beer with almost any level of diacetyl in it at all, it's a beer that I'm not going to care for, despite the fact that like we had Pilsner or Kell in the last show and that beer, that yeast produces a little, a low level of diacetyl that you might not even taste until the beer warms up, but it's the way the beer was supposed to be made. And it's the beer, the way the beer has been made forever. And it doesn't mean that it's wrong or that it's an off flavor, even if you don't care for it. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I'm trying to get people to explore new beers, um, I try to emphasize that the, the subjective objective part of it is to me at least is um, just because there might be something about this beer that you don't like doesn't mean that it's bad um, and doesn't mean that you should be saying something bad about it. Uh, it just means that may, it's not the beer for you. And there are thousands and thousands of beers. So there's plenty out there to find. Right. Yeah. We, we definitely don't even really use the, the verbiage off flavor. Um, we basically just talk about flavor as flavor. Um, we don't, we don't really say, we try not to say that anything is off. Um, for the most part, we want to be able to identify things like diacetyl because again, as American brewers, um, we do see that as a defect. Um, but in our language, when we're, when we're just training on various flavors, we, we try not to get overly philosophical with like what is on and what is off and what's appropriate and what's not um, because flavor is flavor and um, we but preferences that's where it really gets kind of muddy right so um, there's there are basically two different sections of sensory science as a whole and there's the the section of sensory science that's really concerned with the human response so more of the hedonic consumer piece like how how much does the consumer like it um and maybe why does that consumer like it or what does it what kind of emotional response are they having to the flavor? And then we have the other side, which is kind of the, the analytical sensory piece, which I mostly focus on at New Belgium. And that's more of the what what is the product itself? We're trying to describe the product itself. Um, so we have that additional challenge of of taking into account all of the lovely things that human beings give to us, but also understanding that they are subject to emotional biases um, and and you know very various other um, backgrounds that bring us to a place where we either have a different language set or um, different sensitivity. So we try to um, get as close to the beer itself as, as possible because yeah, the the consumer liking piece is very muddy and that's where the really cool statistics come into place and um when you need to get a lot of of people and turns out consumers are quite um they're quite repeatable and the consumer now in the craft beer world even in my short time in the in the world of craft brewing um i've seen the consumer become a lot more savvy so they can certainly describe what they want and sometimes they can describe why they want it um, and they're pretty consistent in, in their liking and disliking of, of different products, depending on what you're looking for. So that's, 
that's maybe a different rabbit hole for a different time. <laughs> well, but <laughs> we, we've touched on a bit of this, um, but let's mm-hmm. um, let's get into how we actually describe beers because let's see, let's go to this and this. So um, this is um, the American Society of Brewing Chemical or ASBC um, flavor wheel. So this is the way that um, people would. Um, especially professional brewers would um, come up with adjectives and basically, I don't know, how would you describe it? Um, It's like a starting point for picking out the different characters of a beer. Mm -hmm. Um, Yep. And this goes, if you, if you start in the center and you can feel free to walk me through this in any, and if you have a better way of describing it, um, but you start in the center and you can see that this is separated into taste and odors. So just from the very start um, of the way that this wheel is designed, and you've obviously thought quite a bit of this wheel, especially because you guys have come up oh, with yes. a new way of describing this. So um, feel free to jump in at any point. But um, so yeah, taste and odors. So taste is only this, I don't know, is that about uh, a quarter of the wheel? And then uh, aroma or odor is three quarters the wheel, and then you have these kind mm-hmm. of parent or um, uh, different families. So oxidized stale, mm-hmm. acid sweet, mouthfeel fullness, aromatic fragrant, nutty cereal, roasted, phenolic, fatty, sulfury, and then it breaks out into subcategories around there. Yep. And I I don't know what yeah, year this yeah, was made. I... Was this is fifties, sixties, seventies? Uh, yeah, it was in the seventies. So it was created, um, and I can't actually see it, but I have it burned in my brain. So, um, I'll, (laughs) I'll be able to just talk about it. Um, it was created in the seventies, um, from Morton Milegard. He was the author on it. Um, and that man was a sensory God. Um, he was, uh, absolutely incredible. He published a lot of really great work, um, but it hadn't been updated since the seventies. Um, and so one of the, the hats that I wear is um, I'm the, the chair of the American Society of Brewing Chemists Sensory Subcommittee. Um, and so one of the projects that we kind of had in our back pocket and on the docket for a long time, even before I was the chair, um, was what are we going to do about the, the flavor wheel? Um, it needs to be updated. It, it's, the science has definitely grown and it has definitely changed um, since you know the, the mid-70s. And so the first thing that we, I started looking at it with a couple of other people and we started thinking, okay, well, first of all, let's just take taste out because taste is actually um, only what you experience when you plug your nose. So sweet, salty, sour, bitter, uh, umami, and like maybe metallic, maybe fatty. There are some some candidate tastes out there, but it's anything that has a specific taste receptor cell on on your tongue, um, in your taste bud. Um, so for, we first wanted to be accurate with what taste actually is. Um, and then we wanted to integrate mouthfeel because mouthfeel is only a tiny little sliver. So we wanted to, to integrate some of the sensations. Sue Langstaff, um, in the early nineties published what's called the beer mouthfeel wheel. And, um, that thing was really cool. It was, it was robust, um, and we wanted to kind of integrate the work that she had done into the wheel. Um, and then we also wanted to encompass more aromas. Of course, in the 70s, it was built on light lager. That's basically what existed. And in the craft brewing world, we have myriad flavors that can come out of beer. Um, and we knew we weren't going to encompass absolutely every kind of stimulation that you can get from craft beer. But we wanted to broadly be able to capture um, most things that uh, we know to be in beer. Um, so after kind of fulfilling all of that different criteria... I I had this big Excel spreadsheet and I plopped it into a wheel and it was completely illegible. (laughs) There was no way that we were going to fit it into a wheel format. Um, And so we kind of blew up the wheel and created um, the beer flavor map. Um, So it's a little bit easier, but it's, it, it follows the same logic as the flavor wheel and that it starts in that first tier by being a little bit more broad. So um, fruity, for instance, is just broad. So as you're tasting a beer, you can identify, Oh, this is, this is a fruity beer. But as you start really thinking about it and internalizing the flavor, um, you can say, okay, well, it's it's not just fruity, it's kind of citrusy. 
And if you think about it a little bit more, well, it's not just citrusy, it's actually grapefruity. And you can get to a specific uh, stimulus um, and experience. And um, I have, so that's really what I have a, a, a version of the beer flavor map pulled up right now so we can look at the different yeah. organization of it right now. Yeah, awesome. So yeah, we, we organized it really similar to uh, how the how the, the wheel was was organized, but we just kind of expanded it out. Um, the other thing that, that I, I don't really like about the wheel structure is it gives this um, false image of like continuity that it's just continuous. Um, and flavor really, there's nothing, you know, if malty is, is on this side, like nutty is on this side and citrus is on this side, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're completely like diametrically opposed. It just, I mean, they're just two flavors. So the wheel kind of did that. So we wanted to, to break it out um, and go based on what you would normally experience. So you usually experience something broad and then you can um, kind of coax it down into a specific attribute um, after giving it a little thought and also after being prompted. Um, the cool thing about the beer flavor map is is that every flavor in there, every aroma, every taste, every mouthfeel in there um, has at least one known chemical compound that exists in beer that is known to elicit that sensation. Um, so we can go back and say, all right, you're experiencing something that's, that's um, you know, moderately corn-like. Um, it could be dimethyl sulfide. It could be this sulfur. It could be that sulfur. It could be a bunch of different things. Um, and so everything has a, a justification for something that we've, for a chemical that we know to be um, in beer. So that's, and that's important that's too because cool. um, that you can you can take that and pull that out through like a gas chromatograph or a similar instrument and get that very specific um, chemical compound in uh, like a computer readout and then you can go back to your sensory panel and say here's the um, quantitative now let's get the qualitative that's associated with it right. Yeah, that's the holy grail. Um, at New Belgium, we have, um, I would think, a, a world-class chemistry department. Um, they are amazing. Um, and we work together quite quite a bit um, to try to correlate different chemicals what, for what's in beer. So we know our thresholds of various chemicals that um, are kind of known quality indicators. Um, but we use sensory to inform that, and then we can measure that throughout the process. Um, but they're... There's a lot of gray space, even in the in the G, in the gas chromatograph world. Um, not everything can be identified easily. Um, so at the end of the day, we work really closely together, and we try to merge our two data sets to get a better understanding of what we're uh, what the overall quality of our beer is like. Um, but at the end of the day, if we're tasting something, if we're experiencing something, and if it's not showing up on our instruments, we know that that humans are, are many times more sensitive and uh, we're, we're as close to the consumer as you're going to get. So typically um, sensory to, to use the term sensory trumps analytical uh, for the most part. Um, you know, we have a question here from <laughs> chat um, in regards to um, mouthfeel. And if you could go into a little bit more detail, um, the question is would mouthfeel be what people would say dry or crisp? Um, and I have the section of the beer flavor map with mouthfeel broken out up here too. So if there was anything specific okay. you wanted. Okay. Um, well, um, again, that's burned into my brain too. So I can, I can imagine what it looks like. Um, yeah. Mouthfeel is so in, in sensory, we're concerned with visual aroma, our taste and our, our tactile sensation. Um, so touch as well is something that we want to integrate into our flavor experience. And um, in the beer world, it's it's what we feel in our mouth. So mouthfeel is is touch. Um, so it can be either chemogenic responses. So any kind of sensation that is felt in the mouth that's brought on by chemicals. So that would be like CO2, carbonation is a chemogenic sensation. And so that's anything from like tingly to like stinging CO2 sensation. Um, so that's a feel that we get in our mouth or, you know, um, another, another chemogenic response would be like capsaicin, um, the burning that you get when you eat a ghost pepper or something that's, um, that's a mouthfeel. Um, the other thing is, is chemogenic. Um, uh, so chemogenic sensations, which 
is sorry um kinesthetic <laughs> i was just talking about that so kinesthetic sensations which is just um how we how we feel in space basically um so that's like the body of a beer the thickness the thinness so if you think about um the force that it takes for you to move your tongue through the matrix of the beer as you're moving your tongue back and forth um <laughs> while you're drinking beer uh is is the level of the of body so the more resistance your tongue feels the more heavy or more full-bodied a beer is um so think about a light lager it's light-bodied thin beer um and your tongue can move pretty quickly through it but think of like a chewy kind of chocolate stout or something that is a, a thicker bodied beer so that's what we mean by by mouthfeel it's just a sensation that we feel with like the weight and the heaviness um, and also the the like tingling carbonation sensation and also uh, the drying sensation. So like what you mentioned, um, that would be like chemogenic. So any kind of you, you hear the word tannic, like a really tannic wine or a tannic beer. Um, tannins are basically just polyphenols that um, quench onto proteins. And so they are literally binding salivatory um, proteins and taking them out of your mouth solution so it has a mouth drying effect. So if you take a sip and even that's even happening as like I as I'm talking. Um, so as you take a sip of something and you kind of feel a sandpapery kind of sensation once you kind of put the tongue on the roof of your mouth, that would be the sign of like a highly astringent or highly tannic beer, um, a very dry beer. Um, something that's a little bit more cloying and sticks around, um, is less tannic, maybe a little bit sweeter. Um, think about like a vanilla porter or something like that. Um, does that answer the question? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. And, um, okay, cool. uh, we actually, uh, I'm, uh, we've got some links to, um, the iOS and the Google play, um, links for draft lab in chat. So we're going to go through two new Belgian beers, um, later, um, in, in this episode and we have links so you guys can follow along um, because we'll go through and evaluate the two beers. Um, but uh, since we're on the subject of draft lab and we have all these great adjectives for describing beer, um, if you could tell me a little bit more about how draft lab got started. And I know we've already talked about the beer flavor map, but what, what about the app specifically and, and the genesis of that and what your, you and your partner's vision for it is? Yeah. Um, so we, we had the beer flavor map. Um, it's this really great two dimensional model. Um, but there's just so much more that you can be utilizing. There's so much more to, to beer in general. So we live in a digital age. How cool would it be to be able to, um, delve into the flavor of beer, um, even further with, with an app. So I've always wanted to develop an app. Um, this is a, person I, I probably have like six apps on my phone now i'm not i'm not too much in, in the tech world um, you're a very but, front range outdoors girl right yeah i'm a front range outdoors girl i, I ride my mountain bike and i i have a phone um <laughs> so uh yeah but i i always kind of envisioned this uh this information to be utilized and and um just like further expanded upon in, in the digital space. Um, so we were looking for, for someone to help develop an app for a while. And, um, my partner, Nicole, um, she, she serendipitously found, um, some app developers that are absolutely brilliant and lovely people and beer, not just beer enthusiasts, but they're also, um, experts in, in, coding um that's what they call it <laughs> and coding um and they've also learned a lot about sensory and so we've we we met at the master brewers association uh conference a few years ago and just started talking about the vision of what we would do with with an app and um i've been i've you know i've looked at a lot of different sensory software applications um for for my purposes at new belgium and really everything that existed out there um, just like was so close and just didn't quite do what I needed it to do. It either did way too much, um, was incredibly complicated, took basically a statistician to be able to to interpret the, the output 
um, took maybe like took a very long time to even set up a project or set up a, a taste panel. You had to have a full time sensory scientist to be able to even like start. Um, and there's a huge cost barrier to entry with a lot of the sen sensory software systems that existed. Um, so really, since I've been in sensory, I've wanted to develop something that was made for me. So this is kind of like a selfish thing. Um, I wanted it to be able to be robust, but um, not overbuilt, um, beautiful, easy to use, user friendly, um, and also gives you the 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 data in a very interpretable manner and gives you a place to store it and, and draw upon your data in, in a greater capacity. Um, and plus it's pretty fun to use. So um, really we wanted to be like very low cost um, made for craft brewing. And we wanted, um, we wanted to be able to set up panels very quickly and we wanted the information to be actionable and um, interpretable. So you didn't have to have like a full-time uh, sensory scientist on board. Um, and and I, I think we've hit those things and we're continuing to build off of it and and make new pieces that we're integrating into it. Most recently, we developed a malt section of the of draft lab that has a base malt flavor lexicon and it works very similarly to it works the same way as uh, the beer portion. Very so cool. you can describe malt. Yeah, you can describe your malt now. Um, so that aids in new product development and, you know, with a lot of the craft maltsters that are coming on board, um, we all need a way to consistently make sure that the pale malt that they're producing is the same pale malt that you expect out of your brewery, Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so quality assurance has typically been done mostly analytically um, in the malt world. And we're now starting to really um, honor flavor and put it where it should be. Um, so the, the malt malt pieces now there um and basically the 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 main objective was make sure that brewers can can um measure their beers for consistency and overall quality and then it was also um intended to make us all better brewers um so start systematically tasting our beers and understanding the flavor space um, in our brewery and even in others breweries and um, understanding whether or not we can consistently make the same beer more than once. So the stats are um, elegant, robust, powerful, um, and the data interpretation is uh, really, really cool. And additionally, it's just a place to keep all of that tasting data. Um, so we've been seeing it used mostly for quality assurance, new product development, um, a lot of um, a lot of people are tasting their beers out in the market and comparing it to the target description. Um, and a lot of breweries are tasting their beers against the fresh description and um, tasting aged beers and seeing how their beers are aging. So um, it's, like I said, it, 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 there's kind of just a lot of ways to utilize this, a similar testing program um, to get at different um different answers to start answering different questions that brewers can pos potentially have. But the idea was quality, consistency, become a better brewer with new product development um, and make it in a platform that is flexible. Like we, we all need flexibility in, in the craft brewing world, <laughs> as you know. We have a question here from chat um, from our French Canadian friend Giggle. Uh, he says, would you yeah. would you see the app to eventually work with Beersmith, Beer Alchemy, and or other brewer's tools when developing predictable tastes and odors? Uh, yeah, we've, we've kind of thought about, um, you know, integrating into different systems. Um, but really right now, um, we... We like to we like the standalone product. Um, we like the flexibility that we have to to grow it and and see it as like it, it, it develops um, as for what our consumers need for what our customers need. Um, and so we we haven't. You would see that it would work really well with a lot of different tools that exist right now, but um, full on integration into different software applications that exist, um, not. Not right now. Um, something that isn't definitely not off the table, but we want to be able to um, grow this consistent with um, with uh, where the industry is going, and we want to maintain the the nimbility to do so. So we've primarily used Draft Lab um, here in the stream as a visualization tool, um, especially because mm -hmm. it has such a great 
um, um, library of adjectives. And also, once everybody gets through that um, initial tasting, you get those really great um, pie charts and um, mm. and data visualization, really, so that you can look at a chart and say, okay, we have this, we had XYZ beer, and you know, this percentage of the pie chart is this flavor and it just go down the line and you get a really great snapshot of it. Um, yeah. The way that we use it at work, which um, I think is probably a little bit more of the intentional way of, is we, uh, our, our head of sensory is working very hard to get um, our panelists set up um, to build the baselines for all of our different beers or different brands so that we can get those true to brand tests up and going. But that takes a really long time because first you have to train all of your panelists, which um, maybe we can uh, take a little bit to, uh, uh, we can take a little, uh, hold on just a second. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> if we can take just a little derivation, um, maybe we can talk about how a sensory panel gets started or one way to get a sensory panel started. Um, and then mm. once you have a panel, um, what it actually involves uh, or what's involved in a day-to-day -day, uh, tasting and then how you would use draft lab to do that work. Yeah. Um, well, I think you, you already hit on the training thing. Um, we want to make sure that our, our panelists are using the same language. Um, so training is huge. We train every week at new Belgium. Um, and a, a couple of the main objectives that we're looking for in training is, can we call out different flavors that have um, quality implications? So can we uh, detect diacetyl? Can we detect isoamyl acetate? Uh, diacetyl to see if there's a fermentation problem. Isoamyl acetate to see if there's a potential yeast contamination. Um, you know, mustiness to see if there's, uh, you know, potential Britannomyces infection. So it's it's all trying to uh, use our flavor to troubleshoot the process. Um, so there's that piece, but there's also that trueness to brand piece, which is is honing in what is fat tire flavor or what is eight hops flavor, um, and that's just through repeated exposure, um, and and um, and describing it, and describing it over and over and over, basically, um, and then adding adding various like chemical attributes to it to see if our panelists can identify it. Um, but it's also making the connection of like, well, what is this brand's flavor and how can we repeatedly make sure that our panelists can identify it as such? Um, so there are various techniques to be able to, to what's called validate a panel to make sure that they know what fat tire is, uh, know how to call out a beer that isn't fat tire um, and know how to pick out various flavor defects. So um, training isn't, you don't just go to a couple of trainings and then say like, I am now a trained panelist. Um, it's some, it's like riding a bike. If you don't use it, then you'll totally lose it. It's not like riding a bike is what I meant to say. <laughs> it's not just a fat tire. Uh, pun. Unless like, yeah, it, yes, it's not just a fat tire pun either. Uh, so we, we train often, uh, every week. Um, so training kind of integrates throughout the entire program. Um, but then once we have our panelists and, and we, we know that they can give us repeatable data, um, then we start utilizing them. And in our case, we put them in a partitioned booth space and, um, and give them a, a set of fat tires that, or whatever beers that we've recently produced, have them taste it next to the description that they have generated and they have validated. So I guess the, the first step is understanding your baseline target description. So what are you going for? What do you, what is fat tire? Um, and that is done through um, how you guys have used draft lab in the past is just describing it with your entire panel, um, aggregating that data, and then based on frequency of use, coming up with a target, target description for your product. Mm -hmm. Um, and then validating that and making sure that it's robust by adding different anchors like uh, low to medium um, nuttiness, you know, adding some different anchors there. So that's done through uh, multiple different batches to make sure that you can make that beer consistently and that you have a really robust target description made in plain language. So you have your target description and then you can measure all of your subsequent batches next to that target description by having your panelists taste fat tire, whatever it is, um, and give them that description as well and basically ask, okay, visually, is it what it's supposed to be? Aroma, is it what it's supposed to be? Taste, mouthfeel, is it what it's supposed to be? Um, and Draft Lab allows you to do that by um, 
getting that target description and then the the individual panelists can say yes or no um and if no if it's just not that then why so that we can the the sensory specialist can troubleshoot what might be going on in the process um so that's where our panelists come into the booth area. They do that, that evaluation, um, and then they basically leave for the day. Um, and we do that every day, um, and it's, it's, it's mostly for quality assurance. But um, again, sometimes we'll give them a new beer from the pilot brewery where we want to know, what is this beer? And instead of biasing them by saying, this is a mango habanero spice beer, um, we just say, this is a beer. Um, and have them taste it and evaluate it without knowing what the brewer was going for. And then we tell them, well, this is what the brewer was going for at the end of their evaluation. Is it that or is it not? And then they have the ability to say, well, I never said the word mango. It's more on the citrusy side. And so we give that feedback to our pilot brewers when we're developing uh, something that they intend, when they are visualizing something that they intend. Um, and then uh, we basically tell them whether or not they've hit that. So with Draft Lab, the brewer can actually input a target description based on what they're going for, um, and the panel can evaluate a beer next to that target description or after evaluate a beer without any bias and then get that target description and see is it that or is it not so it can be used in recipe development um, as well. So that's the panelists will do recipe development um, and shelf life as well. So they'll basically be given a beer of a certain age uh, or multiple beers of different ages and uh, put it next to that target description again, that, that fresh target description. And the panelist is asked to do their, their evaluation. Um, and then at the end kind of asked is overall, is this beer still what it was intended to be? And it seems kind of like a broad, vague question, but um it, it becomes a little clear as you can see, well, this is what it was going for. These are all the flavor attributes that were there. This is what it is now. And sometimes the answer is yes, it's still within code or no, it's not. And so we make decisions um, about our, our best buy dates um, on panel feedback as well. Um, one of, so one of the that's comments, kind of all. In the, one of the comments from chat yeah. is that this evaluation process sounds brutal. And I don't know why, but everybody has these ideas that we just sit around and drink beer all day long, right? There's no, there's no work <laughs> that gets done. It's just. Right. Yeah. yeah when people say, uh, oh, you're a sensory scientist, you drink beer all day. I just, I usually just say yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. It's much easier. But really it's. <laughs> it's uh it actually takes a lot of training and um and it it's it's it is a lot of work so uh we know that our panelists are devoting a decent amount of their time um and expertise to help us ensure consistency and quality so that's kind of the the day in the life um of of the panelist um and that's that's how draft lab can be used it can be used in a lot of different uh ways also to evaluate in out in the field as well so, and having this uh, formalized yeah. process is so important because like you had said before, when if somebody walks in or walks up to you with a beer and says, here, try this, doesn't it taste like such and such? Or they give you, a, hand, hands you a sample and says, this is mango such and such, and you taste the beer, you're biasing that person and putting that thought into their head and whether or not, it's almost impossible to put something like that out of your mind once somebody says it and to... to codify it and to have it done in a controlled way where you're not pre you're not incepting that idea into their brain uh is super important <laughs> right right um yeah so we we try to we also sometimes will put spikes on panel just to make sure that panelists are staying on their toes and um and are giving us not falling asleep at the wheel for instance <laughs> to use this terrible metaphor. Um, but they're, we, we want to make sure that they are really paying attention to what they're doing. So sometimes we'll just like put in a low level diacetyl spike or something like that, just to make sure they got it. And we'll tell them like, Hey, that was diacetyl. Stay on your toes, guys. We need you focusing. Um, so it is, it is pretty cool. Um, and we, we have at least 10 people evaluate, um, every, every beer that we produce. So, um, by the time, beer gets into the consumer's hands. It's been tasted at least by probably about 30 different people throughout the process. So it's, it's pretty cool. We're very sure that what you're drinking is um, of high quality. <laughs> and for those of you who are not familiar with the way that the brewery works, throughout the process doesn't just mean, okay, now we have a bottled or uh, beer out of a keg. It's 
tasting it. I don't I don't know how many different points you guys have, but tasting it um, in the fermenter, um, pre, post dry hop, maybe depending on the beer. Um, it could be pre centrifuge, post centrifuge at the packaging tank. I, there are so many different places that you can take a sample throughout the process to try to um, have different um, different points along the way. Yep. Yeah, we taste in maturation, um, sometimes pre-dry hop, post-dry hop, um, in the bright beer tank before package, and then during the packaging run, and then after package. So, um, and then throughout shelf life. So a lot of tasting of the same beer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a lot of work. Uh, it, it, there's not just a magic faucet that you turn on and the beer comes out and everything's fine. So, um, <laughs> Right. All right. So we've talked a lot about describing beers and we've talked a lot about Draft Lab. Um, and we've talked a lot in general. So let's, uh, let's get into the two beers that we're going to try today. Um, so you're going to have to give me a little bit of background because, uh, mm -hmm. these two beers are part of the Voodoo Ranger series, which to my knowledge is relatively new for you guys. Yes. Yeah. Uh, gosh, when did we launch the Voodoo Ranger series? It, I don't know, months ago. Okay. <laughs> But yes, relatively new. Let's say that. And um, and I hope this doesn't offend anybody in your marketing department. But um, Voodoo. Uh, I'm not so lips. So you guys, I don't know if you still do, but you had the Lips of Faith program at work, which uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but was almost like a reward for your panelists, who um, either the people that did the best job in sensory or most consistent or some type of um, prize structure, essentially had the opportunity to make a beer in the pilot system. Um, that's close. Okay. Our that's actually our our loose lips, loose lips. Um, okay. program. Yeah, yeah. Um, that and that uh, that was basically um, every every so often. It was kind of like quarterly ish. Um, every so often, we would mix four or five different beers in different proportions and get all of the coworkers together and have them taste it. And uh, whoever got closest to guessing what they were and in what proportions were able to make a beer. And it actually wasn't on the pilot system. It was main system. And it was just, there you go. Let's just do it. Um, and we typically just kegged that beer and, and sold it locally or, or to some accounts. Actually, I, I won the loose lips once and I, I had my beer in Chicago and it like blew my mind. Um, <laughs> I was like, they, they got a keg at Longman and Eagle. And I was like, yeah. Um, so, so that, real quick, did, that was loose did any of the loose yeah. lips beers graduate to lips of faith? Because yes, yeah. Okay, maybe that's where my confusion was, and I think I yeah, had mentioned yeah. to you too. When you start putting voodoo in the mix, um, uh, one of the very early, to my knowledge, lips of faith beer was Johnny's Voodoo, because I brought my oh. I bought my brother yeah. a Johnny's Voodoo shirt years and years ago, probably one of the first times that I went to Fort Collins, um, and then when I saw Voodoo Ranger. And it didn't have anything to do with lips of faith. The, there was a little bit of disconnect there for me, but I wasn't. That that doesn't really mean that much. But um, I, I did. You're a, a special case. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, the the Voodoo Ranger series has existed for a little while. It's just uh, we're trying to keep it, uh, keep our IPAs kind of in a consistent brand family, um, and you know, give it a cool character. And it's it's marketing. <laughs> it's it's cool. I I, I really like it. Um, but we, I, I chose two beers that I think are pretty different, um, within the Voodoo Ranger series, um, to talk about. So the eight hop and the Imperial, um, and, and they are, they're pretty different. So if you're tasting along, but did you want to start tasting? Yeah. So here, <laughs> let me, um, let me get a, um, a new description set up in draft lab. So let me pull that up, pull this up real quick. Sweet. There I want to do it with you. All right, so our new description. Mm -hmm. And um, eight hop, right? Not hop eight. Mm -hmm. Eight hop. Uh, eight hop. Okay. Yep. And add tasters. All right, so this should, you guys are seeing this on stream, but we'll put it in chat too, just in case. Um, the code is going to be. WK, as in Andrew WK, 97K. So if you guys want to follow along and add your tastes um, along here in Draft Lab. And I have, um, uh, I have the very basic setup here. Uh, or, so this is the, 
this is the free version. Of course, the pro version mm-hmm. has a lot more, um, I don't know, I guess features. It's more robust than the mm-hmm. free version. Would you just agree? Yeah, it's, it's, there are just a lot more features. Okay. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we'll go through and we'll do an evaluation on this. So let me, um, let me open my beer. Yeah, I already did it. Mm-hmm. We even have glassware specific this time. Do you? Yes. New Belgium glass? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's awesome. I do too. All right. Um, I don't know. Should we Should we just go through and do a description and then go back and discuss it um, so that we don't um, bias anybody with what we're tasting? Sure. We go... Yeah. Okay. So let's take a, let's take let's a, take a couple, couple minutes. minutes and we'll work through here and um, and then we'll go back and we'll evaluate what everybody says. So. I'll hold this up and I'll, I'll, I will do what, um, basically what I would be doing at work if our, uh, Caitlin, our head of sensory sat me down or knocked on my door and said, Hey, can you come taste this beer real quick? And she would have something mm-hmm. built into draft lab and she would put a sample in front of me and say, can you please evaluate this for me? Do you have five minutes? So, um, I will go through oh. this and, uh, I'll walk through this. I'm pretty fast at it, so I'll have mm-hmm. I'll probably I'll be a little faster than many, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, you know, I have a I do have a couple questions. So, like um, on particulate size, mm-hmm. if you don't see any particulate, do you prefer to leave that as unrated, or do you go to the first setting, which is low? Um, I, if you really see no, I just prefer to use it unrated because unrated assumes none. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's what I do. But if there's low particulate, then go for low. And And I I know this is a really stupid joke and nobody's going to think it's funny, but me, but, um, one of the celebrity jeopardies from Saturday night live, um, years ago, uh, Jimmy Fallon was playing Hillary Swank um, from right when um, whatever super famous movie uh, came out that she was in. I can't even think of what the name of it is now, but um, she was she was super stupid on Celebrity Jeopardy, and it was <laughs> colors that rhyme with purple, and she described it as light purple. And so every time every time we're going through these color scales, I'm always thinking that light purple is going to show up somewhere, and no no one thinks it's as funny as I do. So. Oh my God, we should integrate that into just your version. Light purple. <laughs> and just not tell you until you get a refresh. <laughs> that, would, that would be pretty great. Hey, we got some weird update. Do you have any idea what this is about? Yeah. I don't think Caitlin would be super pumped. Probably not. Because <laughs> every single beer would be light purple. <laughs> um, in regards to lacing, um, I've we've mm-hmm. discussed this um, at work before, but um, lacing maybe not a super important um, uh, quality, or it's difficult to tell if your beer has good lacing if you don't have really clean, perfect glassware too. Do you agree? Yes, yeah. And it's it's hard in a, in a taster glass too to even look at lacing. So um, I don't pay a, a lot of attention to lacing, um, but it is um, it is definitely indicative of a dirty glass if you don't have good lacing, but it's also indicative of your beer foam not being super robust. So it is it is a quality parameter, but I look more at like foam retention and quantity um, than lacing, especially when you're doing it out of like a six ounce taster glass. Mm-hmm. All right, so I've gotten through the first part, so we're gonna go over here to aromas. So um, actually, maybe um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, maybe we can go through um, we don't have to talk about the descriptors that we're um, interpreting, but how do you tell your panelists to evaluate a beer in terms of um, the, the steps that they go through when they get to aroma? Um, all right. Well, while you guys are doing this, I'll, I'll go through the, the long process. Um, the first thing we do is we actually hold the beer in a different way than we normally would if um, if we were just drinking it. You can hold it however you want if you're just drinking. But if you're evaluating a beer, we do what's called the, the pinch and pinky hold. And so you pinch it and then put your pinky on the bottom of it. Um, just And that's kind of just awkward. So you're kind of just subconsciously telling your brain that 
you're now evaluating beer. You're in evaluation mode and you're not in just like drinking tasting mode. Um, but specifically for aroma, we start swirling and then I'll push my laptop back so you can see my whole body. Um, so we start swirling and then we bring the beer to our nose. And just like right when we get something, we pull it back. And we do that multiple times. And the reason why we're doing that is to try to coax out those small sulfur compounds because they're really volatile. So it's easy for them to come out of solution. Um, and they're also really saturating as well. So if you were to just like take a huge sniff, then you would automatically saturate your olfactory receptors and you wouldn't be able to really smell them. So you're just trying to like dial it in and get your sulfur. So those are like H2S, which is kind of eggy and, and uh, you know, sulfur springs like, and SO2, which is, Kind of like lip match, um, DMS, which is c corn, black olive juice, also some like other sulfurs. Uh, you're also like some some of the sulfurs in this beer in particular are like really kind of tropical. Um, so there's there are thiols that are that are tropical, and kind of even mango like. Um, so you do the distant sniff and then you do the one second sniff. So it's just swirl and then take a series of couple one second sniffs, and then a longer two second sniff. I'm in the drive. Oof, I'm not good at swirling still. In the drive by, <laughs> just like trying to get like all the you're trying to get like esters now at this point, and then uh, so bigger molecules. And then what you do is the the cover. So we use petri dishes. We just steal them from micro and, and cover our glasses. But you can use your clean hand to cover your glass and swirl for about ten seconds, which seems like an eternity. Like ten seconds is kind of a long time. So still swirling. And then you take a sniff and you should get a lot more out of the beer now. And that's like where all your kind of like aldehydes and various other chemicals are coming out. They're larger molecules. So you should get a lot more. And then we do retronasal olfaction. So we take a sip, actually plug our nose, take a sip and then breathe out of our nose. And that's called retronasal olfaction. It's the same mechanism. Still volatile chemicals are hitting your olfactory bulb, but you're doing it retroactively. So breathing out of your nose. Um, so that's that's the aroma. Um, and then we do taste. So we actually still plug our nose. The tastes are those that you can that you can taste without s smelling. Like so, it's anything that has a specific receptor on on your taste buds. So sweet, salty, sour, bitter, umami. So we actually plug our nose. Take a sip, breathe out of our nose, and kind of think about the the progression of sweetness, saltiness, sourness, bitterness. So that's taste. And mouth feels pretty much the same way. Do that the the tongue flapping. So just try to get um, understand what the resistance is and the astringency. So kind of suck on your tongue a little bit. Swish it around in your mouth enough to coat your entire palate. And then think about like the linger. Is there a, a bitter linger? Is there an astringent linger? Uh, that kind of thing. So that's the basics of evaluating a beer. <laughs> Hopefully you've done that now. <laughs> All right, but I'm the only completed taste. Only? Almost through here. I think they were all you following, and I will at least following have one. along so, um, so closely that they weren't working through it yet. All right. Well, now you have some time. One thing that I really like about um, using this app, <clears throat> and I'll pull it back up on the screen here, is that when you're going to, um, hold on just a second. Oh, I'm so used to using the pro version now, I'm not used to using the, the free version. Mm, um, yeah. Is that when you're in, um, when you're in the, the parent categories or the mother categories, or however you like to describe the, the overarching categories, um, you might, you might be evaluating this and since this is the first beer that we're trying and it's a little bit in um there's no context there's no control that we're tasting against um i always have a little bit of difficulty tasting beers that are um that that i don't have something to compare against so when i'm mm. I, I try to have at least something else to go back to just to get a compare and contrast but when you're going through um sometimes for me it can be difficult to pick out yeah, even something that's very basic, unless I have something to taste mm -hmm. against. But you might say, okay, well, yes, I get fruity. I don't 
I can't say yes, it's berry or stone fruit or tropical, but I definitely get fruity. So you can just pick fruity and click done yep. and it's going to choose fruity. You don't necessarily have to get super deep with every descriptor that you have. Right. Yep. Yeah. That, and I actually did that a couple of times on this one. I, I chose, uh, um, like, well, it's floral. I'm not exactly sure what floral, but it's floral. <laughs> All right, we'll do just one another minute. Is there anybody actually, if anybody's in chat is doing this along with us, feel free to say something. Otherwise, we'll move on um, to the finished part here. I don't see, I'm not sure that anybody else has the beers with us. That's entirely possible. Um, uh, but when we'll see how we did. Yeah, so when you get to your completed tastings, um, you first get the um, the visual, and an aggregate of two is not a very big um, pool for a tasting panel, obviously, but we can go through here. So uh, moderate foam, um, light amber. I think I actually went a little bit lighter than light amber. Maybe it was like more of a dark yellow, but we're in the, we're in the kind of golden straw family. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, Depending on the light of our house. Yeah, and the... And the <laughs> what you're if you're holding it up against a white sheet of paper or there's a lot of um a lot of visual acuity that can play into the color that you're seeing um white foam uh clear beer um i'm getting some lacing on my glass but it's light and like i said um sometimes sometimes you don't really you can't really judge the lacing until you're done with a whole pint of a beer it's it, um, sometimes it's super right. obvious um it just depends on what you're drinking out of and the quality of your glassware. But yeah, certainly um, some beers, like we make our Berliner Weiss that um, ends up being on yeast for a long time. And because it's on the yeast for so long, it really, I think, breaks down the proteins and it ends up having almost no head at all. Um, right. And that's mm -hmm. not because of the glassware. That's just because of the way that we make the beer. So, um, so as we get into the descriptors here, let me skip over to aromas. Um, we get this super cool pie chart. Um, so the half of the pie chart is fruity. Um, we've got about um, a little bit less than a quarter is floral, a little grassy, a little herbaceous. And I know I put cereal in there because I was getting some, um, some malt mm -hmm. character mm -hmm. um, coming through. Yep. And then um, the breakdown for fruity, guava, lemon, grapefruit, tropical peach, um, floral, rose, uh, some fresh cut grass, maybe some thyme in the herbaceous, and then um, some malt character for cereal. Um, so depending on who you have on your panel and how used to coming up with these adjectives or looking through a chart and, um, and assigning what they're tasting and smelling to these adjectives, you can get a pretty um, wide range of different answers. Mm -hmm. And then if we jump over to tastes, um, for me, this definitely has an assertive bitterness, but it's not overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely some lingering um, bitterness, but not necessarily unpleasant. It's just a lingering bitterness. Mm -hmm. um, it's It seemed yeah, like there's- Yeah, we were aligned on that. Say again? We were aligned on oh, that. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> some, uh, some malty sweetness. Um, not really a lot of lingering sweetness. Um, and then a little bit of, bit, yeah, lingering bitterness. Um, and then mouthfeel, uh, medium body, um, with some low astringency. So, um, if you were doing this in the pro version, as you have a couple of people um, put their different descriptors in, it automatically aggregates all of your tastings and mm -hmm. basically pumps out a generated um, descriptor, which is what we're looking at here. And uh, if we were, if we had more people, and not to say that our two tastings are not a valid way of going through this, but if you had more, um, you could mm -hmm. make a descriptor of this. If, if you had never had this before and you wanted to describe the beer, you could say, it's a bright, light amber colored, um, medium white foam, some light lacing. Um, there, you can you might be able to pick out guava, lemon, grapefruit, um, tropical flavors, maybe some peach, some fresh cut grass or herbal characters like thyme, uh, rose, maybe some other florals with some also some malt character. It's a moderately bitter beer. 
with a mild lingering bitterness, moderately sweet, lightly sweet linger, uh, lightly sweet linger, medium body, a little carbonation, some astringency, slightly warming, and moderately mouthwatering. So that's obviously quite a bit, and yeah. you might not have that be your baseline for um, if you were building this um, as your uh, as your as your descriptor for your true to brand, but it's definitely a starting point, which is, I think, the really important mm -hmm. part. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So we would do this a couple of times with a, a large group of people, and you eventually get to a target description that has uh, been validated by multiple people, and it is um, what you're going for um, henceforth. So it's, it's a pretty cool tool. I'm always really happy to see that finalize. It all kind of comes together and you're like, oh yeah, that's what that beer is. We're like, it's cool to see it come together from just kind of clicking on what you're experiencing. So we have a question here from chat. That's how it works. Um, so after a decent yep. sample size of these tests, you'd be able to attribute the trends noticed in the flavor pool to the beer. Um, how do you mean, or maybe you can be more specific on that, Kev. After a, def after a decent sample size of these tests, you'd be able to attribute the trends noticed in the flavor pool to the beer. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess if you, if when, when I think of trends, I think of um, maybe more of a slight, of a, of a change from start to finish. Um, whereas hopefully you're trying to have your beer be the same every time and be repeatable. But um, Oh yeah. So he says like, so if a good people say that um, there's a nutty character, you'd feel safe saying it's a nutty beer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. That's definitely the idea is that you have mm -hmm. repeatable results across a wide variety of tasters and evaluators. Yeah. 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 That's partially what like the aggregation of the data is all about. Like if you, it usually doesn't end up in a description if only one person says something random. Um, it has to be, you know, multiple people saying the same thing for you to actually make it into the description. So, um, yeah, that's hence the, the greater sample size and, um, and making a, a more robust and agreed upon description. Yeah. So yep. actually, do you, can you give us a little bit more background on, um, on eight hop? Obviously it has eight different oh, varieties yeah. of hops in it. As the name suggests, <laughs> it has eight different varieties of hops in it. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually one of my favorite beers. Um, and I think one of our, um, underrated beers, it's, it's a really good IPA. Um, it's five and a half percent ABV. So it's not like a, you can drink a couple of them. And I like beers where you can drink a couple of them. Um, and like a pretty low bitterness. It's only about 35 BUs. Um, so low ish bitterness, um, and then eight hops. So nugget, centennial, cascade, Nelson Savon, Amarillo, Mosaic, Simcoe, and Citra. Um, so kind of a, a wide variety of hops, and they all bring um, their own kind of unique character. What's really cool about this beer is uh, it's it's quite tropical. It's really kind of fruity, citrusy as well. Um, and what what we really wanted to do here was utilize a different dry hopping technique in order to coax out some of those aromas. So instead of the like highly terpenic, um, like resiny, uh, piney uh, beer, kind of like Imperial, which we'll taste soon, um, we wanted to get more of like the softer floral, uh, fruity characters out of it. So what we do is um, we just change our process parameters a little bit, our dry hopping parameters to achieve that. So we actually dry hop on yeast. So we give the yeast the ability to do its own biotransformation of all those hop oils um, and bring them kind of what was at one point really resinous and terpenic into something that is um, more subtle and floral. Um, so the cool thing about dry hopping on yeast is like a lot of those those heavier piney um, aromas will actually bind to the yeast cell and then be taken out on the centrifuge or something like that, um, however you filter your beer. Um, and yeast will actually transform some of those oils into different aromas. Um, so we dry hop that beer on yeast, unlike what we do with Imperial. Uh, Imperial, we wanted some of that like higher resiny, um, uh, like kind of piney, but also like very intense citrus aroma as well. So what we do with that beer is we centrifuge first and then we dry hop. 
Um, and then we sent a few out the hops. So I just think that it's, it's cool that the, the two beers are made in, in different, using different process parameters to achieve different flavors. So, um, that's, that's eight hop for you. And it's one of my favorite beers. And the um, interaction between so the yeast and the drinking. hops is super interesting because, um, some, some or many breweries don't have even the facilities to, to dry hop on yeast, especially because, um, if you're dry hopping the old fashioned way, like we do, where you're literally just climbing on top of a tank and dumping hops in and bunging the tank. Um, if you dump, uh, or if you put hops in a tank that has live yeast in it, you're creating nucleation points and you can basically just get a beer cano out of that tank because you're giving all the CO2 mm. in the beer a chance to break out a solution. And you just dumped however much hops in the top of the tank. So you have to be, you have to have, equipment and you have to have processes that allow you to experiment in those ways yep yep yeah that was definitely a, a bit of a processing challenge because we were actually uh our system is set up to dry hop off of yeast in fact um so we had to kind of change our system a little bit to make sure that we could dry hop on yeast um so yeah it's it's every brewery does it a little bit differently and hence the house flavor. Uh, we could all be using similar raw materials and get different flavors out of our, our, our different breweries because there's so many different production parameters that can uh, dramatically alter the flavor of your beer, pretty much giving a uh, endless permutations of flavor using the same um, the same raw materials, which is one of the beautiful things about brewing. And then also that interaction. And harder to control. Yeah, that interaction between yeast and Hops is one that is, in my opinion, very unexplored, um, at least in our industry segment, mm -hmm. um, partly because of process, but also because it's just, uh, it's a little bit more of a difficult thing to do. But finding those interactions between yeast and um, hops is super interesting because, um, like, we, I remember we made a, like a Belgian IPA one time, and the way that the... Um, I think we had made it with um, Sirachi Ace, which is a Japanese variety of hop that is very citrusy. But because of the what I think, um, because of the yeast um, interaction with the hops, it ended up having um, almost like a dill character and not in a negative way. It was just a really yeah. brilliant, clean dill character that mm -hmm. was not in the raw hops. And it definitely didn't come from the yeast, but it almost assuredly came from the interaction between the two. Yeah, yeah, I've I've experienced that dill character, which is and in Sriracha Ace as well. Um, but it's yeah, it's one of those things that it, it you start with a raw material that smells like something, and then throughout the brewing process, um, it can be altered into something completely different. Um, and if you know what could potentially happen, then you can kind of manipulate the process to be able to uh, get the flavors that you want. It's pretty. Brewing's pretty cool. <laughs> it's the name of the game is figuring out how all this shit works and then making it work for you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so let's uh, let's go on to Voodoo Ranger Imperial, Imperial. IPA. Yep. Okay. Um, pour myself another glass. Um, so I can kind of, now that we're talking about process, oh, this is such a fun beer. Uh, this is a much stronger beer, 9% instead of 5.5. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So pretty high ABV. Um, the the malt bill is quite simple. It's just pale and black malt for a little bit of color. Um, but we use some of the, the newer super alpha hops. Um, so those have just like really high alpha acid content. Um, so they're very bitter. Um, but they're also incredibly aromatic. So Delta and Bravo are two of those. So Delta, Bravo, Centennial, um, Cascade, the classic, Calypso, and uh, Mosaic are all in the uh, – is in uh, Voodoo Imperial. And this beer is, uh, like you said, 99% um, ABV and about 70-ish BUs, so pretty bitter. But it can – that bitterness isn't overpowering at all because it is pretty boozy as well. Um, so the hop aroma is, is quite different. It's more on that kind of heavier piney side, but there's also a, a lot of grapefruit, citrus, orange. Um, I even sometimes get like a blueberry character out of this beer. Um, sometimes like a little caddy, um, mosaic can be a little caddy, um, which smells like cat pee. 
um, but we like it. <laughs> it turns out, or the the better way of saying it is like ripe guava. Um, <laughs> the, that's the, that's how I say it. I, I say ripe guava. Uh-huh. Yeah, the plate. Yeah, when grandma's in town, you say ripe guava. But if you're <laughs> amongst friends, you can say it's like happy. Um, yeah, so that's that's Voodoo Imperial, and this beer has um, seen quite a lot of success. Um, it's one of the harder beers to make for sure um, because it's so boozy. Uh, yeast don't like a lot of stress, turns out, and um, if you put it in a relatively warm fer- fermentation um, with a lot of sugar, you just kind of stress it out, and um, so our, our yeast kind of like struggle. To, to make this beer so we've had to be really nice to it um and and try to give it all the help that it can get to to ferment such a, a boozy beer um so it's made with our house ale yeast um and again it's dry hopped off of yeast to maintain some of those more piney resinous um, aromas that we want in in the finished product um so definitely one of our, our boozier and if you taste eight hop next to imperial um you'll see that the the hop character is completely different um and and that's partially what's cool about just tweaking process parameters to achieve something else so can you um go into a little bit of the details on how you guys decide um your enjoy by dates on your bottles uh for instance my eight hop beer the enjoy enjoy by date is coming up. It's um, August twenty seventh, but my oh. um, Voodoo Ranger is October 29th. So there's quite a big um, age discrepancy there. So um, what's your guys' process of determining the window to best enjoy a beer by? Well, Eat Hop has one of our lower shelf lives. It's a eighteen week beer. Um, so Fat Tire is also eighteen weeks, and Imperial I believe is twenty one week beer. Um, and basically the the process that we if we can do it experimentally if we can determine what our shelf life is experimentally then we choose to do that but for the most part we we log and track all of our all of our brands that we've ever made we taste it throughout shelf life so on a on a monthly basis and um, kind of like what I described, once you have that target description, um, the panelist is pretty much asked, like, is it is it that or is it not? And how has it changed? Like, what's come up? Um, what's gone away? So has it lost all of its citrus character? Has it become a little bit more um, isovaleric, so like cheesy? Um, is it starting to take on some of the less desirable characteristics? Um, is it becoming sweeter? Is it becoming more bitter? Um, how is it changing from its original? And then it, it takes a sensory scientist to interpret um, to be able to see, all right, is it is it that or is it not? Is it close enough? Um, because beer changes the second that you put it into a package. So we can't, unfortunately, we can't put like a two-day best buy date on everything. We have to be pragmatic. Um, so we we basically kind of draw the line in the sand either based on our our uh, past experience with similar beers, um, we can say, oh, well, you know, Slow Ride was a 18-week beer and uh, 8 Hop is similar, so let's use 18 weeks. Um, or we can actually take the time to do it experimentally and uh, draw the line there. But we we have different shelf life dates on most on almost all of our, well, on many of our brands. We kind of have different buckets. Um, but 18, 15 is our lowest, um, that we can, that we can actually go. So it's, it's basically just tasting next to that target description and then identifying what flavors have come up, what have gone down, um, and then determining whether or not it's still in line with its original intent or within the, the normal variability with what its original intent was. If that makes sense. It definitely <laughs> it's does. a little more complicated than that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So yeah, getting a couple sips into this, um, obviously with that nine percent, you get um, I immediately get uh, a def- warming character, especially coming in through the back of your mouth and and into your throat. Mm-hmm. Um, I, yeah, I get, thicker beer. Um, the the citrus I get is much more um, almost like essential oil citrus or like um, pith or rind instead of uh, a juicy mm-hmm. kind of a citrus character. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, it's like heavier orange rind, grapefruit for sure. Um, I get a decent amount of pine, and the malt character is is definitely present, but um, not overbearing. Like the hops are kind of the name of the game here. But when you there's also like a dark fruit thing as well. When you have a double IPA, and especially a beer that's this big, you need malt 
body and malt character to balance up against those hops yes. or else you're just going to feel like you're taking the enamel off your teeth and that's not pleasant at all yeah yeah exactly though it's like a, a, a 1998 um ipa mm -hmm. was just like just throw a bunch of hops in it but now um we have less of a heavy hand <laughs> and they're there this this beer actually has some of the uh, highest finishing gravity so it has some re residual sugar in it and that's intentional so that we can um, kind of balance it with malty sweetness balance like that intense bitterness and intense hop aroma with sweetness so you can actually drink it um, and it's not just tongue scraping bitter so it's it's actually pretty sweet um, this seems I tend towards lower ABV beers um, because I don't often just want to have one beer, but this seems like it would be a good choice for a nightcap or something to sip on uh, yeah. because you can yeah. enjoy it a little bit more slowly and, and not have to worry about uh, having any more after it. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that this is our nightcap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's also one of my favorites. It's my sister's favorite. She drinks a lot of rampant. Um, it's a, it's a solid beer. Again, made in a totally different way, um, but definitely drinkable. Man, as I, I we're just we're just gonna keep. <laughs> it's funny. I'm such a lightweight now. So <laughs> now that I've had like a half a beer, I'm just like, yeah. let's keep talking. No, is um, with, <laughs> with two kids and work and the the <laughs> sh a little bit of amount of free time I have. Yeah, drinking follows a lot lower on the list, and especially too. Um, many people don't appreciate when you're at work and when you're around beer all the time, you don't necessarily want to go home and just drink more beers. Like you just want to take a break. It's not Maybe you want a margarita. Yeah. Maybe you want a gin and tonic. Maybe you just want a nice red wine that you don't necessarily need yep. to challenge yourself with every drop of beer that goes, uh, across your mouth. Right. So, um, yeah, it's not often, like I said, I don't necessarily reach for a 9% double IPA because, I just spent an entire day watching everybody make those or, you know, you want to change <laughs> yeah. it up a little bit when you get home. Yep. I drink a lot of gin. Yeah. <laughs> it's delicious. Everybody should drink a lot yeah. of gin. It's, it's nice in the summer. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, chat, um, before we wrap it up, are there any questions that we um, haven't uh, answered or stuff that you guys wanted us to um, weigh in on that we haven't touched upon? Uh, I think we have covered... A pretty wide breadth of sensory. Um, I'm super excited that Lindsay was able to join us. And uh, is there anything else that we need to add before I wrap it up and we touch on our little beer and video game um, segment that I try to incorporate every time? So the first time um, uh, I played, I have played, and still do play a decent amount of Overwatch. And um, on Overwatch, there's a let me pull it up real quick. We can do a real quick review. Um, there is a, uh, a a level that is in Germany, and I've got to pull up my YouTube channel real quick. Mm -hmm. um, you might get a kick out of this. I don't think anybody else thought it was very interesting when I <laughs> brought this up the first time. But. So, um, videos. Um, the company that makes... Um, the game is Blizzard, and they are a really great um, developer. But they, oh, and I, let me, I'll have to share my screen with you again real quick. Or you know what, you're not going to be able to see it. Um, uh, we had some sharing issues before. But so the beginning of this, you're mm -hmm. in a German castle, and you have mm -hmm. three vessels that are clearly supposed to be brewing vessels, but they don't make any yeah. sense at all. Um, they've got <laughs> pressure gauges on them and they're three of the exact same vessels in a row. They're not different in any way. And they're, they just, they don't make any sense. And for a company that spends so much time and attention to detail, I got super bummed because they, it's just, you look at these vessels and it's like, these aren't brewing vessels. They're not even distilling vessels. They don't, they look like stills. They have two columns instead of one column. So it's just a stupid <laughs> video game nerd. Is it a brewery? Yeah, it's supposed to be a brewery <laughs> and it's not a brewery. And it, it irked me. So and then um, in the second week or the second time we did it, um, uh, there is a game that I've been playing a ton of called Player Unknown's Battleground. And it takes place in a um, uh, essentially a post-apocalypse island. And it's somewhere in 
what seems like Russia or the Soviet Republic or Soviet Union. And um, you go around and you see all this iconography. And last time we did Pilsners. And if you look at the old Beer Hunter footage from when he goes to um, um, the original Budweiser and to Pilsner Urquell, you see this footage from the 80s and it looks like Soviet era buildings with giant stars and hammers and sickles. And it looks like you're in the middle of this video game, which everybody actually did think was funny. So <laughs> this week, um, uh, let's see. Uh, this week, what I wanted to show was um, I have a friend who works at uh, Sun King, um, whose name is uh, uh, whose last name is Atwood, and this is a screen cap from when he played um, The Last of Us uh, years ago. Um, I think this picture is from 2015, but um, I always think it's really funny when beer is represented in video games and the different ways that they do it and the 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 graphic design that they come up with for um, for different packaging. And um, you didn't see it very much, but occasionally in the game you would see these cases of beer that said Atwood, Genuine Draft on it. And since his last name is Atwood, he says, you've officially arrived when you find your own brand of beer in a video game. So I, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, I thought that was pretty cool. And that was a great game. So uh, I, 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 I don't remember where I pulled that, what recess of my brain I, I pulled that out of, but he had tweeted that uh, years ago, and I thought it was pretty great. So that's our one. Yeah, exactly. Now chat is um, haranguing me for, uh, for and there, it's like Bre Brewer is ranting about Overwatch beer vats. First of all, board, they're not vats. We don't brew in vats. We brew. We brew in vessels, so, yeah, so we, don't, we don't need to go down this rabbit hole. But <laughs> oh god, yeah, it's like yeah. next thing we're gonna next maybe next episode we'll do um, um, uh, myths about brewing, and we can talk about how Bach beer is not scraped off the bottom of a barrel, and there's no dead animals in a vat that yeah. somehow make the beer strong, or some other Sit all back. these other nonsense. Don't shake up the keg; you'll make it foamy. It's a pressure vessel. Like, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so if um if we don't have yep, any more that sounds fun yeah, if we do, <laughs> i'll be there <laughs> um if we don't have any more questions um i want to thank you again for uh for joining us i'm so glad that you were able to make it and share your myriad wealth of knowledge yep. and sensory information with us and i think we will definitely keep using draft lab because people really seem to like it um I definitely want to schedule one, another beer school, um, probably for next month. Um, September's a little tricky um, because we have hop selection in Yakima. Oh. Um, See you there. Which is, yeah, I think we're going to miss, are you going to be there for the week of the September 11th or you said it was a different week? No, oh, the 19th oh, the 29th. bummer. We're not going to be able to party in Yakima. But um, ah! uh, hop selection is one of my favorite times of the year. You get to go to where the hops are actually grown and you fill the contracts that you've written um, with specific lots and you get to visit with the farmers and you get to see the processing facilities and you get to see the new experimental varieties and it's just it's one of the most exciting times of the year for me in terms of brewing i don't i assume you feel similar similarly yeah. but i don't want to put words in your mouth yeah yeah it is it's really cool actually you i think you told me last year that you went to a mint place where they were growing and processing and distilling yeah. mint yeah tell me about yeah, that, that was quick. crazy oh. it was it was we it was weird it was a little smellier than you would think that it would be um but yeah they they were mostly it was mostly uh spearmint um the the bulk of mint that is processed in the the u.s is, is spearmint um so yeah it was just like in this huge spearmint field and they're they're basically just extracting and, and distilling mint oil um for you know companies like wrigley that make gum um but i think that that would be kind of a cool application for like hops um just to to like distill it or to distill like different herbs um and and use like the the distillate because it, the distillate coming off was so highly aromatic you just you maintained a lot of those really minty qualities and then just got rid of like the vegetative matter so as far as like efficiencies go how cool would it be like just to like dump in some mint distillate i don't know if that's like me being nerdy but it was it was cool to see and um that it's it was the one of the larger mint uh, distillation facilities and again like their customers are just like you know big 
um, like candy manufacturers and gum manufacturers. It was pretty sweet. That's all in the Yakima Valley, like very fertile valley um, where a lot of like grapes are also grown. So we went to a couple of vineyards, but the mint distillation thing was really cool. Pretty smelly, pretty minty. Yeah, y- um, I smelled like mint for a while. <laughs> Yakima for me is fascinating because it's um, uh, the second most productive growing region in the U.S. next to California Central Valley, right? They grow Mm -hmm. tons of apples up there. Um, The Concord grapes are so thick that when you go to some hop farms, you can't even smell the hops. You can just smell grapes. Like it smells purple when you're walking around. It's crazy. If you have, um, um, I have a buddy that has this condition, but is it synesthesia where you experience certain um, certain things as colors? It's it's like the closest Mm -hmm. to somebody that doesn't have that condition. I think would experience like a smell like it honestly it just it's like it's like your prince or something like everything feels purple when you're walking around those fields but yeah um but they grow the majority of the hops um in north america in the yakima valley it's the high desert plain and it doesn't rain very much but it's really great for growing hops and uh, maybe next episode should be about hops because it seems pretty appropriate and um it's coming up september yeah and uh maybe I'll have to see. Um, uh, I have a buddy who wrote uh, a really amazing book about hops. I actually have it right here. Um, Stan Hieronymus is a beer writer, um, and he wrote this great book about um, For the Love of Hops. It's the the um, Brewers Association's um, most recent publication, uh, Practical Guide to Aroma, Bitterness, and the Culture of Hops. I haven't twisted his arm yet, but he might be interested in coming on and talking about hops with us, especially because it's harvest time. And um, maybe we could find some um, wet hot beers or harvest ales to um, to taste on stream. So that might be a really cool idea. So I will look into that That's and awesome. I will try to um, find a time to schedule that all in and uh, we will see what we can do. But um, Lindsay from New Belgium Brewing, thank you again for joining us. Um, chat, thank you for showing yeah. up. Um, I will try to get the word out um as soon as i can schedule a time to do another one i think once a month might be a good good number because mm-hmm. um there's just too much else going on and nobody's paying me to do this this is purely for the for the grins right so yeah well you're good at short it. short of um <laughs> short of getting uh some kind of stream sponsorship which before trust me i'll tell you that i'll tell you if like ab tries to buy my stream or something like that nothing <laughs> yeah, no that would be awesome no one's coming, really made it no one's coming knocking <laughs> yeah. now brought to you by the high-end portfolio like yeah <laughs> all right yeah that's that's your goal <laughs> all right yeah well thanks guys. definitely my thanks goal. andrew good to see you <laughs> yeah. see you guys thank you guys again um and uh hopefully we'll see you next time Lindsay. thank you and we will talk to you soon Yeah, see you around. See you guys. (laughs) All right, bye, guys.